bit better this week than last week. Last week we did uh, FaceTime Live. That was my very first experience in 37 years of ministry. Um, I've never stopped, we've never had to close a Sunday morning service. And so that's pretty amazing, God's goodness and his faithfulness. And um, how many were able to watch the FaceTime Live? Remember that? Yeah. yeah. So I'm told that was about 1,300, 1,400 people that were viewing that, and that's really cool. But I would rather us gather together, worship together, and be able to share God's word together. Amen? I'm glad that you're here. We honor you for getting out of your driveways I, uh, last Sunday to get over to my son's house of Mile and Pastor Nate and Pastor Mile, get over to their house, I dug out a four foot drift in front of my garage. And so I spent two and a half hours, you know, it was I think about three hours digging a drift, getting that thing out of there. Any drift diggers? Yeah, come on. I got a whole crew that we can commiserate together and, um, I was, you know, Sunday morning, it was just an odd thing for me for a Sunday morning to be out digging uh, a drift and, and thinking, well, this is unusual, but it's good. God is good. And so today I have a really, really good word for all of us here. Um, it, there's really two parts to it. One of it is just um, helping us to understand what promised land living looks like in the New Testament. And then the second thing is that um, I want to help to begin the process of, of equip uh, a whole church because we're preparing for revival in the seven cities. And we want to be equipped for, uh, with, to, to honor. We want to honor lost people. We want to honor the brotherhoods, the brothers and sisters. We, we want to honor those that are in authority. Uh, we live in a time when there's such dishonor and it's easy for that to kind of take hold in our own hearts. And so biblically, I want it to equip us. And um, it's really cool what we have. I would love to be able to just say, and now let's go ahead and watch first service and put it up there. But um, <laughs> some would not be happy with me. So I'm going to speak in the second. And it's not that I don't want to speak. It's just that God moved in such an amazing way. And the word came through so, so clear. And so if you would, well, let's start out at least the way we did in the first service. Would you just open up your hands right where you're seated? And let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and to teach us this morning. So Holy Spirit, we just lift our hands. We lift up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. And we welcome your presence. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. Holy Spirit, not only are you here with us, but you're in us. And you're speaking to us. And so we say, welcome, Holy Spirit, come and lead us and direct us today. Father, I thank you for this time. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Just a couple things. If you have cell phones, please put them on vibrate. Uh, that will be awesome. That will help me. And then two, if your baby starts crying, I love babies. If your baby starts crying, then you can feel free to go out in the hallway. We have TVs that are, things are going. They get calmed down. You can bring them back. And um, that's totally, totally good. And also, if a baby's crying, nobody's in trouble. Amen? We, I don't ever want a mom or anybody to feel like, oh, somehow we're in trouble, whatever. We, we're a family. And we do our best to work together, to love well, and to uh, further the kingdom of God. It was on a Friday, June 8th, 1979, at 7.30 p.m. in an Assembly of God church in Sumner, Washington, and if you can put these pictures up, that Connie and I would join our hearts and lives together in holy matrimony. Hundreds of people came to witness and to celebrate with us in song, as songs were sang, vows were exchanged, and a message of hope, dreams, and encouragement was spoken over us. On this night now, almost 40 years ago, Connie and I would covenant together with God and each other that we would be all in. For better or for worse, for richer or for poor, in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, 
that we would be faithful to one another and faithful to God as we would love well until death do us part. I remember holding my wife's, Connie's hand. She has such a beautiful voice. She's an amazing singer, uh, plays the piano. And I remember her coming down the aisle. We had all this stuff going on. And, um, and her taking a microphone and singing to me. And, and just this amazing voice. And, um, and I, as I, I thought, oh, <laughs> I am so happy that she told me, she goes, I know I'm called to be a pastor's wife. And I, have, I grew up in a pastor's home. And been, I've been in the ministry since my second week on the planet. I think I was in women's ministries on Tuesday, the week after I was born. And so my response to my wife was, honey, are you, well, before, it was, Connie, are you sure that you understand what it requires in ministry? And uh, we had, to be honest, we had a two-year on and on, on and off engagement before we said, I do. But once we said, I do, the, for, the past was forgiven, and um, it's been really good sailing ahead. And uh, it's been good, yeah, really good. Connie is an amazing wife and a wonderful friend. We have served together in ministry now at four different churches, seven years as, in the role of an associate youth pastor, 30 years as lead pastors. There's a passage of scripture found in 1 Peter 3 that has shaped our lives and ministries in a profound way. Peter talks about loving life and seeing good days. The scripture influences, this scripture influenced our lives so much in our family, the churches that we belong to and we're a part of and the, community, the communities that we became a part of. To love life and see good days. I can say for, even before my marriage, I grew up in a home that we loved life, and it was our passion to see good days. In the kingdom of God, when we come into Christ's kingdom, there's this invitation to come in, to leave the wilderness, to leave the wandering of the wilderness, to leave brokenness, and to come into Christ's kingdom, and to come in, and to love life, and see good days. It's in the New Testament, and it's in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you find it in Psalms 34, verse 12. But in the New Testament, you find it in 1 Peter chapter 3, and that is to love life and see good days. Jesus said, I've come that you might have Isn't it interesting that it seems like one of the largest tools of the enemy is to destroy the longing and the love that we have for Christ, this redemptive hope that we share in our soul. And for many people, many Christians even, they're limping along just trying to make it rather than thriving in a place of anointing and blessing, loving life and seeing good days. There's lots of reasons for that and today I want to quip because the truth of it is, is that in this life we experience difficulties. It's not a Pollyanna Christianity. Jesus said in John 16, um, John 16, I think it's 33, he said, in this world, in this life, you will have troubles, but be of good cheer. Say, be of good cheer. For I have overcome the world. I want to go back to the one wedding picture, the one with all the family over here. And, and so the truth of it is, as I look back for almost 40 years ago, this year will be our 40th year anniversary, as I look back and I look up there, my brother Bob is right next to me. Pastor Drew pointed out in the first service how close he was to me. He actually is that close. We're, we are super close. And I don't know if he was just making sure that Connie was all on board or what, but he is pretty close. My, my first cousin, Don, this great friend, uh, is right next to him. His brother, my cousin Michael, died at 33 right here in Pasco, Washington. He was an airline, as a um, control tower uh, guy, and he, he had contacted cancer, loved Jesus, filled the Holy Spirit, beautiful wife, beautiful children, and he passed away with cancer. Right next to uh, uh, Michael was Kevin Gussman, and he was my junior high and high school best friend. We were in the church in Marysville, 
And um, Marysville, the first assembly there, and uh, I brought him to church with me. He was sitting with me. And uh, I went to sleep in the service. And I woke up to see him down at the altar giving his life to Jesus. And I honestly thought this was like a sophomore in high school. And I thought, man, it must have taken me to go to sleep for my friend to come to Jesus. I'm I'm not even sure with all of that. But he gave his life to the Lord uh, in high school. And then then my my brother-in-law, Drew's dad, Daryl, my sister's husband is next to them. Jim Sundom was my roommate in college. If you remember a couple weeks ago, the story that I talked about and the prophetic word that was given to me um, in Vancouver, Washington, it was his home that I was staying in. Denny was 15 years old at the time, healthy, strong boy, and he dove into a foot of water. He thought it was 10 feet of water, broke his neck, was paralyzed from the neck down. And two years earlier, and, and so he's in our wedding there. And my, Kevin and my oldest uh, cousin, Dave, is, is there. Dave was born with one eye and uh, has gone through life uh, very smart, very gifted, but challenged with, with, those, with those things. Kevin, um, I had heard that he was working um, from Marysville, from where we were fun, from, and he had ran, ran his hand into a press, and he was in the hospital. His hand had become mangled and, and beat up, and so I went and visited him. I left our church and went down and to pray with Kevin, and now Kevin is far from God at this point, and, and uh, I said, Kevin, I said, God loves you. He's speaking to you. I said, he wants a relationship with you, and I remember Kevin's response. You tell God to back off. He's laying there in bed, hand all wrapped up. And not a number of years later now, Kevin, in the the same kind of accident that happened to Denny, and Kevin dove into a foot of water, broke his neck, and passed away just um, a few years ago. I want to love life, and I want to see good days. The devil comes to rob, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus said what? I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. I have come, say that with me, I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. What I'm describing that is in this and, and what, I'm, what I'm talking about, New Testament promised land living, I am not talking about heaven. For many churches, it's not described very well. People think that, oh, the promised land for us as believers is in heaven. You don't need a promised land when you go to heaven. You're in heaven. You don't need faith. You don't need confidence. You don't need miracles. You're in heaven. You've been given a new body. You're going to live forever with the Lord. Forever you will be with the Lord. You don't need promised land living when you go to heaven. You are in eternally with the Lord forever and ever. Where eye hasn't seen and ear hasn't even heard or we can't even imagine all that God has prepared in advance for those who love him. But in this life, just like in the Old Testament and the series that I've gone through, is that in this life, there is, we can, there is a, a wilderness to leave, and a promised land to enter in the new covenant. Many Christians are just oblivious to it or maybe don't understand it, but in the passage that I'm going to bring up and and I'm going to talk about how to... Now, when I talk about a Christian that is in the wilderness, they are fully saved. They can be filled with the Holy Spirit. They can speak in tongues and operate in all kinds of gifts. So it has nothing to do with um, their love for God and their, their influence. What, what, has, what, had hap- what has happened is that they've gotten discouraged and they've chose to go ahead and just stay out camping. How many have ever gone hunting in the wilderness way up high where it's cold for about a week? That's wilderness wandering. You stink in three days. You have greasy, greasy hair in four days. By f- 
the fifth day, I don't care if there's a thousand elk with huge horns, I'm going to go down and get a shower. We're not designed to live and wander in the wilderness. We are designed to enter promised land and walk in presence and power and anointing. And one of the things that Connie and I put in our marriage and, and, th- and have seen it throughout the four different churches that we've been involved in and in ministry, one of the things that we ask God to do is for every person that is here to love life. Do you love life and do you look forward to good days? Well, I'm in my 90s. Well, especially do you love life? Are you looking forward to good days? And we said, well, you know, I've gone through some pretty rough times. I'm just trying to make it right now. Well, Jesus made this promise. He said, in this world, you will, say with me, I will have tribulation. You don't have to pray for it. You don't have to believe for it. Certainly, you don't have to ask for it. It's just designed as part of promised land living so that we can grow and mature in our faith, that we can walk powerfully with God. And through difficulties and trials, we're designed to walk through, not take a detour and go into the wilderness. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna equip us today of how to stay in promised land living no matter where you're at, no matter what you're going through. Amen? Everybody on board? Well, I'm really a wilderness wanderer. Well, I can't help you, but I'll help the rest that are not wilderness wanderers. Amen? So I want to help us with the word of God and the truth of who God says you are. And um, uh, just such a powerful word. We believe that God has placed a longing in the heart of every human soul to love life and see good days. So I want to do something just before I continue on. It's a verbal declaration. I want you to say, I love life. And I plan on seeing good days. I love life. I want the devil to know that I love life. And I plan to see good days. Yeah. Hopefully the rest of this day, that those words will reverberate throughout your spirit that I love life, and I want to see good days. Thank you, Lord. So my big idea, promised land living, is for all New Testament believers. I refuse to agree with the devil, the world, and the hosts of darkness about my life and my future in Christ Jesus. I just refuse to believe, I I refuse to partner with the devil. I refuse to believe half of what the world says to me. I've had people say to me, are you feeling good? I say, yeah, I feel great. No, you don't look that, are you feeling, I said, no, I feel good. You're not gonna convince me into a cold. (laughs) You're not gonna convince me that I'm having a heart attack. Now, if that's the case, I need to get some help. But... But it, it, the world, see the world, they don't know any difference because they haven't been transformed into the light and the likeness and the wonder of Jesus. So I refuse to agree with the devil, the world, and the hosts of darkness about my life and future. In this life, God has given us power to overcome. Say power to overcome. For through God we shall do valiantly. It is he who treads down all of our enemies. Psalm 62, verse 12. So this promised land living is for all believers. The apostle Peter writes to the early church about promised land living and the importance of life talk. He describes how to love well, to speak life over each other, and how to create a culture of honor. So if you go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it reads like this. Peter begins with verse 8, chapter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Say, finally, all of you. So say, finally, all of you be of one mind. 
Have compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So number one, be of one mind. Be of one mind. The New Testament, for New Testament promised living, begins with the mind of Christ. Be of one mind. Have the mind of Christ. The Apostle Paul explains and describes the mind of Christ this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. It says, for who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. So I want you to take your hands and put them on your head or over your spirit and say, I have the mind of Christ. So if you're a believer, you have the mind of Christ. Oh, we need to get excited. Oh, we need to get excited. We, we've got this promise. We've got this promise to love life and see good days. Well, I don't feel like it. We're not going by you feel, your feelings. I'm going by the word of God and the faith and the promises of God's word. You can choose to live in the wilderness, but as for me and Life Church 7, we are going into the promised land and we're gonna declare God's goodness and we are able... We are able to go through whatever comes, God's spirit, his presence, having the mind of Christ, I am able to overcome. I am able to overcome. I've looked in the mirror and I said, Wes, you are more than able. I've had wars. You you can imagine in years of ministry, I have had wars with my own soul, wars with criticism, all kinds of things. And I've looked in the mirror and I said, I have the mind of Christ. I am more than able. Through God, I can do valiantly. It is he who treads down all of my enemies. The enemies are never the people of God, and they're never lost people. They are always the works of darkness who want us to go out into the wilderness, live a defeated life, and limp into eternity. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Through God, you can do valiantly. For it is Jesus who has already defeated all of your enemies. We never fight for victory. We always fight from victory. Jesus finished work on the cross. He finished. He said, it is finished. The devil's a defeated foe. I never repeat the lies of the enemy. Because he's a liar. He's the father of all lies. And there's no truth in him. Why would you repeat the lies of the enemy? I'll ask again over here. Why would you repeat the lies of the enemy? Why would you repeat things about you that are not true? Why would you say things about God that aren't true? Why would you believe things about yourself or your family that aren't true? See, once you get into your soul that I love life and that I will see good days, that my wife Connie will see good days, that my son Nick and my son Nate and their wives and their children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and our great-great-grandchildren and our great-great-great-grandchildren will serve the Lord because we're gonna love life and see good days. You win this battle and you move into promised land living and you are prepared for whatever comes your way because through God, you will do valiantly. Because he is with you. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Am I teaching or preaching? I think I'm preaching. (laughs) That doesn't matter. It's all good. Jesus did both. That's good. Be of one mind. Say, one mind. I have the mind of Christ. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm dangerous. I have the mind of Christ. That's a good word. Isn't that a good word? I have the mind of Christ. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. So the Apostle Paul explains and describes the mind of Christ. Peter writes, 
Part of having the mind of Christ is having compassion for each other. Part of having the mind of Christ is having compassion for each other. Man, we need each other. We need to be for one another. Love as brothers. Go ahead and show that picture up there. Uh, Pastor Drew pointed out in the, in the first how close my brother was. So when we love as brothers, that's what that looks like. <laughs> I won't tell you any Bob and West stories. We'll keep going because be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for or evil or reviling for reviling, but say this, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. So it looks like this. Everyone meet Dave. This is Dave. And so I want to bless Dave today. So, so I just say, Father, I just bless Dave. I just speak blessing over him. I thank you that you bless him when he gets up in the morning. That you'll bless him when he goes out. I thank you for your grace and your anointing that you'll bless him with health. That the presence and the goodness of God will rest on him. I bless my brother Dave. Now, that's literally a blessing. And, and he gets the opportunity of saying, oh, I received that. Or like many people will say, oh, he does. Negating the blessing that was just placed on them. And that's nothing more than pride. That only God can bless me, nobody else can. But when we're actually designed in the body of Christ to bless one another. How many see that? How many times have I blessed dear people and they go, oh, he does. And I said, that wasn't for what he's done yesterday. It's for now. Don't you want a blessing now? They go, and, and literally I've had people dig their heels in and go, no, he blesses me. But it's a lack of understanding of scripture that we are actually called to bless and not to curse. Wouldn't it be horrible for me to put my hands on David and say, oh, David, I just curse you today. I curse you're going in. I curse you're going out. I hope you have a wreck. You go on and on and on. And yet, don't we do that at times when we criticize one another? But see, we're not called to do that. That's not our, that's not our mantle. That's not our anointing. Well, you know, I'm just saying what I, in Jesus' name, stop that. Start saying what Jesus is saying, not what you think. You have the mind of Christ. Well, you tricked me. No, you have the mind of Christ. You have access to heavenly realms. Um, Ephesians chapter one, verse three, that it says that we're seated with Christ in heavenly realms. I don't think I'll be on face. Oh yeah, they're trying to film me. Sorry, I'm back. All right. Yeah, I gotta get tethered up here. Probably have to tether me. Yeah. Number two, partner with Holy Spirit. I'm gonna love life and I'm gonna see days. I'm gonna partner with the Holy Spirit. Psalm 16, 11 says, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Jesus has come to give us life and joy and peace. He's come to set our hearts on fire with the love of the Father. Our primary calling is to love the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, to love our neighbor as ourself. There should be no self-hatred among us. No self-hatred. You are a fine dude, a mighty woman. You're, a, you're an amazing lady. You're created actually in God's image. And when you were made, God said it is good. Yeah. Well, no, don't do the well. Just say thank you, Lord. I am what I am by the grace of God. Thank you. Thank you. I just received that. Yeah. Because our old nature and pride wants to not partner with what the Holy Spirit, with the mind of Christ. And the enemy wants to keep us from loving life and seeing good days. But number two, when we partner with the Holy Spirit, we love life and see good days. As the worship team comes and as we prepare for communion, let me finish uh, the third thought that I had for this morning. Life talk, uh, develop a culture. We want to develop a culture of honor. Honor affirms 
Honor affirms value. Honor defined is high respect, great esteem. And um, this week we have on, I think it's on Tuesdays, we all meet together. We have a whole staff of pastors that we meet together. And so we planned out the next six week series and where we would be going as a church. And as I was looking at that and I was preparing my message uh, along that, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday, the Holy Spirit just arrested my heart and, and spoke to my heart and just said, you know what? How many times have you done life talk as a senior leader? And I said, in, in ministry, probably out of the 30 years, probably 26 out of the 30 years in different places. And the Lord, Lord just began speaking to my heart and says, so why isn't this sticking in the hearts of people? What is happening? What is keeping them so that every year it's almost like not only a refresher course, it's like a crash course to start speaking life instead of death. What is it that keeps us wanting to go back into the wilderness of death talk and fear talk and unbelief? And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and, he, and, and, the, and these were the, the words literally that came and I wrote them down. Life talk is not sustainable without a culture of honor. Life talk is not, could you imagine in your home with a husband and wife, if all the talk was there, there was always honoring, you always honored your wife. What would it look like in your home, ma'am, if you always honored your husband? You just refused to ever dishonor him. And we use the excuse, I'm just speaking my mind. But, but remember, we have the mind of Christ. <laughs> You've been given the mind of Christ. Your old nature is supposed to be dead and gone, buried. It stinketh. And when it comes out, it stinketh. You've been given the mind of Christ. You are partnering with the Holy Spirit. And we've been invited into a culture of loving one another well, blessing, speaking life. I said, well, you know, honestly, Pastor Wes, I feel like part of my work is conviction. I feel like I'm to help do some of the conviction. Well, I'm sorry, that's not your work. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He does all the convicting, all the convincing. My work is to encourage, to build up, to strengthen, Occasionally, I'll have to, as a senior leader, I'll do some correction, but most of the time, it's to build up and to encourage. And could you imagine, could you imagine what your home would look like with amazing honor? I could go on, but we're actually going to go into six weeks where we equip this entire body to love well and to honor well and to be able to sustain what God's about to do in the seven cities and at Life Church Seven. Our best days are ahead of us. Amen. Amen. During the 2016 Olympics, the the ladies four by one hundred team um, were preparing to run and they had won the gold. In 2012, they're getting ready to win the gold again in 2016. They're, they they're pretty much already have the pouches to carry the gold. And they're the fastest. They've got the best time. And I remember actually going back, as my son was talking about, I remember watching that race. And as they began, they have the, they have the fastest first leg, second leg, third leg, fourth leg. But it was in the early leg that the, the exchange of the baton being passed from either the first or the second or the second to the third was dropped and they lost the race. When we enter into death talk and fear talk, when we refuse to allow the mind of Christ to rule in our hearts and our mind, it's like dropping the baton and what is you're all invited into what God's it, this sweet land that flows with milk and honey to love life and see good days. Trials for sure, but Christ will walk us through. We are more than conquerors. 
that I would love for Life Church 7 to be a non baton dropping congregation. Amen? Say, ah, oh, Pastor Ralph, Wes, it's pretty rough right now. I understand. We'll stand with you. We'll stand with you. We're not going to lie about the things that aren't challenging. We'll stand with you. We'll walk it through. But God is faithful. He'll walk you through. He'll see you. He is able. When you're going through a tough time, keep walking. Hmm? You're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Really keep walking. Just keep walking. God is able. Amen? So good. So we're going to receive communion. If you just stand with me, we're going to enter into some worship time, and Pastor Drew is going to lead us in just a minute.